It's Christmas. That time of the year when we remember the birth of a child. But not just any child. J.I. Packer was a well-known evangelical theologian and teacher. And I think he lived most of his life in Canada. He died about 18 months ago. And he just reflected that many people have struggled with the Easter story. How could the death of one man deal with the sins of the whole of humanity, past, present and future? Packer points out that the problem with the Easter story, if you have a problem with it, is rooted in the Christian story. Once one realises who was being born, the question of the value of his death kind of resolves itself. Our Gospel text for Christmas Day this year are the first 14 verses of the prologue of John's Gospel. John's Gospel's prologue is John 1 verses 1 through to 18. And I understand that there are no ancient texts of John's Gospel which don't have the prologue. They are, it is always present. And the prologue sets the scene for what is to follow. In my view, it's the high watermark of Christian theology. So let's hear it. The first 14 verses of the 18 verse prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the light, the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light that gives light which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world through him came into being. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of human will, but of God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. The word for word here is logos. And it was understood by all cultures of the day that John was speaking into. It's true that they all had their own take on it, but there were many shared understandings. So here we see that the Logos, the Word, is God in action. And this shouldn't surprise us. There's a sense that in me, immediately, it takes me back to the first chapter of Genesis and to the first words that are uttered. And God said, let there be light and there was light. When God speaks, stuff happens. The word, the logos, is the expression of God's intent. It is God active in creation. I've been helped by Daryl Johnson, also in Canada. He's a, a Presbyterian scholar and preacher in that country. He was a long time a, a lecturer at... Um, Regent College. He simply refers to the Logos as the divine expression. So let's notice some things about this Logos, this divine expression. I want to read again verses 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word, the Logos, was with God, 
and the Logos, the Word, was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. For God to be God, the word, the Logos, was always part of Godness. Nothing that was, or is, or will be, happens without the activity of this word, this Logos. Notice that life was inherent in the word, in the Logos, and that life is shared. All life is derivative from the, from the life of the word, from the life of the Logos. There's this miracle of life that is happening millions of times, it's every day. And yet we fail to notice. It's so common. And yet I want to suggest that every time it's a miracle. And it derives from that one source. That one source of light and light. In verse 9 we read, The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. Now this text is a little bit ambiguous, and I've noticed that John does this quite a lot in his Gospel. It can be read in two ways, as we read it here in the New Revised Standard Version. The true light was coming into the world, referring to the birth or the incarnation. Or it can be read as we have it in the King James Version. That was the true light, which lighteth everyone that cometh into the world. Both are true. The Word, the Logos, was coming into the world and is the source of life of everyone who was coming into the world. This Word, this Logos, is the source of all life, yours and mine. As Colossians 1 reminds us, in Him all things hold together. Or as we read in Acts chapter 17, as Paul quotes one of the Greek poets, it's in him that we live and move and have our being. Now here's the amazing thing in verse 14. And the word, this logos, became flesh and lived among us. This word, this logos, took on corruptible human form and lived among us. It's literally tabernacled, pitched his tent among us. It seems to emphasize the sense of temporiness, of fragility, of vulnerability, which we all experience. And then it goes on to say, though, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Glory has a number of ways of being understood. The most obvious one is brilliance or brightness. It's the image that most normally comes to mind, we see something that is very, very bright. But along with that, it also has a sense of weight, of weightiness, of heaviness, that it leaves an indelible impression on the beholder. Like a brand mark, it has that sense of weight and leaves an impression. And there is one more. It also has a sense of essence, of what and who this really is. And I want to suggest that this is what we're seeing here. In Jesus, we see the essence of God of what God is really like, of who God really is, that God is Christ-like. The last verse of the, pro, of the prologue, which we didn't read, reads like this, verse 18. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Again, it's Daryl Johnson who describes this as the God, the only Son, 
who is close to the Father's heart, who has exegeted him. It's like he's done a deep dive to show us who God really is, what God is really like. He's bringing it out for all of us to see that when we see Jesus, we see God. And it's the birth of this one. Born in a stable, in dangerous and unpredictable times, in a politically unstable part of the then known world, to an unmarried mum, far from home, her only visible support, a man she barely knows, that we celebrate today. In this circumstance, the Word becomes flesh, pitches his tent among us, and we celebrate that today. May God bless you and yours. May God's assurance of his continuing love and commitment to you be yours this day and in the days ahead. Amen.